<laughs> Ooh, finance! <laughs> 700 billion US dollars. That number stands for the total global revenue opportunity currently not tapped into, that is women finance. That means money that is lying on the table, but no one's taking it home because the finance industry underserves women. 700 billion US dollars. That number is so big that I couldn't make sense of it. I had to write it down. It's a seven with 11 zeros. That's a lot of zeros. I only have those in front of the number on my bank account, not in the back, <laughs> unfortunately. 700 billion US dollars, and that number makes me so angry for two reasons. Reason number one, it's a shockingly, absurdly high number. If this was any other customer segment, men who drive cars, men who have dogs, men who are eccentric CEOs with questionable views on workers' rights or the home office, <laughs> men who have lives, or something, men who breathe, any other customer segment, it would have companies rally for a piece of that market share as if Taylor Swift concert tickets were on sale. <laughs> but it's only women. So the financial industry kind of collectively shrugs their shoulders and goes, that's not our responsibility. It's not our fault that women earn less and therefore have less and therefore invest less and therefore aren't worth as much as our other customer groups. Those 700 billion US dollars you just saw on the slide tell us that that's not a very accurate statement. And actually, it's a quite historical bias. The banking system that our system is based on today is 500 years old. So lots and lots and lots of years of head start for the people that got to participate in it, right? And for many decades, centuries, this finance industry has excluded large groups from access. The largest one of them, women. It's only since 1962 that women can have a bank account in Germany. That is 61 years ago. Some of us here have grandparents and favorite songs and favorite movies that are older than that. So yes, welcome to the system. The game kind of started um, a little while ago, 500 years to be exact, and uh, we're not going to explain the rules to you and you also don't understand the language because, let's face it, I don't care how many languages you speak, financial is its own kind of weird language with an almost not understandable dialect. Uh, but you have access, so between doing all the other things that you do, you know, work, care for parents or children or friends, getting all the, the Christmas gifts, having all the mental load, doing everything you do on your day-to-day, -day, like self-improving, I don't know, meeting deadlines, plucking your eyebrows, smiling but never too much, never too little, just the right amount. <laughs> <laughs> and everything else we do as women and non-binary people in a world that wasn't built around us, there's one more to do. Aren't you happy? It's to make sense of the finance world. Exciting. And the finance industry just kind of goes like, well, you have access now. Great. You can have bank accounts. You can have a credit card. Have at it. Isn't that enough? I wouldn't be standing here if it was enough. Of course, it's not enough. You can have access and still face discrimination. You can walk into a bank branch today, being a woman, going about your life. We can copy and paste everything about your life, your job, your age, your education. We can copy and paste it into a man, have them walk into the same bank branch. They'll get a better interest rate than you. And why? Because banks believe that because we have less money, because pension gaps, we must be not credit worthy. And there's tons of studies that disprove that, but it's taken the industry a little while to catch up with reality. Uh, so this is where we are. You can have access and still be made to feel very excluded. I'll give you an example. My wife and I bought an apartment uh, three years ago, four years ago, and we went to the banks to get financing offers. And when you want to get something financed, you fill in a lot of paperwork. 
You sign many papers, the stack is about this big, and you put all your details all the way from your birth. And they know a lot of information about you. What they could have known about us is that between the two of us, we had 30 years combined experience in the finance industry. And we were married to each other. <laughs> and yet, when we went to the bank, they would ask, well, um, so do you have a male friend that you can bring so we can explain these big numbers? Or when they called to set an appointment, they would ask, or, you know, can we talk to your husband? We just want to make sure you understand the interest rates. This didn't happen in the 1980s. This happened four years ago in one of the largest, most well-known German banks. I'll give you a second example. Um, my trans and non-binary friends, they face different pieces of discrimination that are just made up for them, specifically just for them. When you want to use any kind of identification service in Germany, uh, sorry, banking service, you usually have to go through some kind of identification first, right? And this is where my trans and non-binary friends get stopped in the process or outright rejected because they don't look or sound like what the ID agent expects them to look or sound like based on a picture or based on a name. My friend Fumi, we talked about full names today, Chiyowa Oye Fumi Taovi. Uh, she's from Nigeria and when she borrows money, she borrows money in Nigeria. This is despite the fact that when she takes out a loan this size, she loses a little bit on service fees, a little bit on transaction fees, a little bit on conversion fees, and she has to wait seven days. But she'd rather wait and lose that money than go to a German bank branch, because when she goes in, she's often faced with racism. People will say to her, do you have financial decision power? Do you understand this language? Um, and that's really silly. We talked about AI today. We live in a super, super modern day and age where content can be localized like this into hundreds of languages. And yet in Germany, most banking solutions, if they offer a second language, that's a big if, that'll be English. That's all. That's a little silly if you ask me. So I think we can all agree that needs to change. But if we change that, that's only the bare minimum. The bar is literally on the floor. You can't see it, it's behind the TED. <laughs> <laughs> what I really want is for banks to live up to their true potential, which is enabling financial independence for everyone. I want them to lobby governments. They already do that. I want them to lobby governments for other things than they do today, um, to do more to eradicate pension gaps, pay gaps, unfair tax advantages and disadvantages that usually hit marginalized people the most. I want them to partner with schools to bring knowledge to kids. I would have learned how, I would have loved, how to, uh, I would have loved to learn how to do my taxes in school. Maybe not first grade, but later when it became more relevant. Instead, I learned things that, I'm not sure I learned them, but I forgot things I learned. And most of all, I want them to educate people contextualized on where they are right now in their lives. You're a student, you're starting your first job, you're buying a house. Here's what financial planning can look like for you. Here's what you need to know about financing requirements. Here's what you need to know about pension gaps and pay gaps and your rights actually at work about your salary. Here's information that should be given to you <laughs> freely, but if no one else does it, we'll do it. You're queer and you're looking to become a parent or you're a straight couple with trouble conceiving. Here's what fertility treatments and adoption can mean for your budget. There's so much that needs to be done. And in fact, someone already has done it. 2010, we're in Lebanon, BLC Bank Lebanon. And we pause here for a second to look at surprised faces because when I talk about gender equality, Lebanon might not be the first country in your minds. <laughs> Can you raise your hand for me if you thought, yeah, Lebanon? <laughs> no? No one? Surprising. Well, let me tell you then. In 2010, BLC Bank in Lebanon did a large analysis of all of their customers, and they found that women were a very small but very profitable part of their business. They defaulted less, they paid back more reliably, and when they invested, they invested very successfully. 
because they didn't have time to mess around with anything. <laughs> they can be losing money. So they invested very defensively and long term, which most financial people will tell you, excellent strategy. But they also found that despite the fact that many women in the country were small business owners, not a lot of them banked with BLC. So BLC went out and they talked to hundreds of women and they asked, why don't you bank with us? What do you need to bank with us? And what can banking do better to serve your needs? And the women told them, you know, we really need more local branches. I can't afford to travel four or five villages over. I don't have the time to do that just to, you know, sign something for the stack. And they told them, I also need longer opening hours because when you're open, I work. When you close, I still work. When do I go to the branch? And lastly, they shared many discriminating experiences where staff has spoken to them condescendingly and not taken them seriously. And surprisingly, the women did not appreciate that. So what did BLC Bank do? They opened more locations. They extended their opening hours. They trained all of their staff on how to treat women with respect. They also hired more women. And one thing they didn't do was listen to the other banks that said, Ugh, don't do that. You're going to alienate your male customers and the women don't have any money anyway. The women don't have any money anyway. Let's fast forward to today. The women's segment makes up 20% of BLC's profits. The profits have increased year over year, as has their customer base with both women and men. No non-binary data collection in that country, I'm afraid. Um, but the men actually appreciate being at the same bank where their wives are and for their wives to be treated with respect. Again, surprising, mind-blowing. I wish someone would have known this. I wish there was a way anyone could have known this before. Um, and today, 53% of their staff are women, 44% in managing physicians. That's over a decade ago that this bank has committed as one of the first in the um, Middle East and North African regions to economic empowerment of women over a decade ago and we have yet to see another player follow suit. For them, it started with analysis, and that is super important because, of course, women aren't this neat little nice niche where one size fits all. There are entire groups that are invisible to most industries, but also to the finance industry, and they're single mothers. They're women aged 50 plus. They are women who are financially dependent on their partner and they face poverty when that partner divorces them or dies. You can ask any financial planner the two statements they hear most often from women and they will be, my husband is taking care of that or my husband is gone and I don't have any idea where all of our accounts are. I worked in the finance industry for over 14 years and I can tell you that more than 75% of my women colleagues did not manage their own finances or had insights into the family finance. This is where we do a very short show of hands. Who here manages their finance? And I mean more than your credit card and bank account, actively. It's more than I expected and it's less than I want. <laughs> <laughs> so there is so much to do. Again, coming back to my trans and non-binary friends, to the people of color, they're shoved into a different box of invisibility because people assume you don't actually have what it takes to make that decision. You don't have any money or you're an imposter. You're a fraud. You're not who it says on your ID. But they are. So what can we do, really? Well, we can talk about money more. We can talk about what we invest in. We can talk about salaries, but we can also check who we bank with. What values does that bank have? And I don't mean on their website. I mean, in reality, do they see women as its own, as their own customer group? Or are we just a subset, a deviation of the standard customer, which is a man? Are they committed to financial independence for everyone? Everyone, genderless. And what do they do with your money? Because that money that's sitting in your bank account right now, that's not just sitting in your bank account. That money's getting invested. And maybe it's getting invested into countries or companies or industries that you don't want to put any money into. So check who you're banking with. And if you don't like what you find, change banks. 
for those of us working in the financial industry, we can change banking. And that's my call to you. I said two things annoy me about the 700 billion US dollars opportunity. Two things. Number one, how shockingly, absurdly high this number is. Look how many seconds it takes me to walk across the whole number. <laughs> that must be a lot of money. And it's so easy to change this. First of all, how long have we ignored women's needs for the number to get that high in the first place? And second of all, why don't we change it when it's so easy? It is analysis, better and more targeted products, and education. That's all it is. But the second thing that really annoys me about this number has nothing to do with how high that number is. It has to do with us fixing this being a historical responsibility that the financial industry has. Financial inclusion needs to be available to everyone. Financial independence needs to be attainable for every single person. That includes all women and that includes all non-binary people. The 700 billion is just the business case to get there, but this is the goal. Thank you.